Growing up in an upscale suburb of Chicago, Nicholas Coleus was the all-American high school kid. What's your family like? What was it like growing up? One of four boys, you know, just a really close-knit family, very caring parents. And for me, I, playing sports and especially football was a huge aspect of my life. I always wanted to continue playing football in college. You were the first one in your family to go to college, right? So yeah, I was the first one out of my direct family to go to college. His gridiron goal would become a reality at the University of Rochester. You must have been so excited when you got on the football team. Yeah. What were the team dynamics like? Very small school, private university, um, only 8,000 undergrad. And so the football team was extremely close. But Nicholas wasn't all tackles and touchdowns. I'm also a classical pianist. You're quite accomplished. Thank you, yeah. Senior year and fall semester at the University of Rochester is in full swing. But this Friday night out would be like no other. So December 4th, what was that day like? So it was just kind of like any other day. Nicholas and his fellow teammate and fraternity brother, Ani Okiki Iwu, are hanging out when Ani gets messaged on social media. And Ani kind of looked over to me and he was like, hey, I have these two girls who want to hang out. So I said, sure, why don't you have the two girls come over to my apartment and we can hang out with them there. So Ani took a quick picture of me and sent it to them. The girls must have liked what they saw. Not long after, Nicholas and Ani meet them in the parking lot of Nicholas's apartment. They didn't want to go in my apartment, and they suggested that we go over to their place. Were there any, like, red flags for you this time, like, talking to them? Did anything seem, like, Not really. strange I mean, about them? They were in a nice car. Nothing seemed unusual or abnormal. The students jump in the girl's car, and off they go. But soon, the changing scenery catches Nicholas's attention. I started to notice that the neighborhood was not so good anymore. Then before I knew him, we showed up at the house. The address, 22 Harvest Street. It was dark out, and from the outside, it seemed like a decent house. A decent house and pretty girls. The night ahead was looking good. But once inside, that all changed. The next 40 hours had to be the most terrifying, horrific of your entire life. I remember physically feeling sick uh, reading about what happened. Yeah, I sat down on this couch in the living room and next thing I knew was just the lights went out and about five to 10 men in just masks come out just screaming so many loud noises and just are all armed with bats and bars and knives, guns, and the first thing that just pops in, I mean, fight or flight. I got up as fast as I could and tried running to the side door. I only made it about halfway across the room before I felt something like being pressed up to the side of my upper leg. And then the next thing I remember is just being on the ground. Nicholas had been shot in the leg. My leg was like gel. It was just flopping around. And somehow I managed to get back to my feet and get to the door. He may have made it there, but he wasn't home free. And I remember looking out the door and seeing these two other girls that were standing on the outside. And they were holding the door closed from the outside just making sure we couldn't escape. So escape. the two girls that like said, come hang out with us, they were the ones holding the door shut or is two different two ones? Two different girls. What had seemed like an innocent college date night was suddenly looking like a vicious setup. But why? Now injured and delirious. Was nothing I could do. And then I just remember getting hit over the head with a bat and I'm laying on the ground. These men are just screaming, just don't fight us, just take it and don't try and escape it's friday night university of rochester football players nicholas colias and ani okihiwu are excited to hang out with a couple of girls they met on facebook 
The women take the students to 22 Harvest Street. But it won't be the kind of hookup the boys are expecting. It's a setup. I was just like freaking out and I didn't know what was going on. Multiple men wearing masks jump out and attack the students. Nicholas is shot in the leg and hit over the head with a bat. How did you not pass out from the pain? I don't know. It's only the beginning of a 40-hour nightmare. They tied up her hands and legs and dragged Ani and I into this bathroom. Nicholas is beaten with a hedge trimmer, a bat, a pipe, then hit over the head again, this time with a fluorescent bulb. I just remember like touching my head and having all this blood just coming down everywhere. They were having so much enjoyment with it that they started recording it. A warning, the video you're about to see is graphic. While one of the kidnappers records, two of the others are seen threatening Ani with a hedge trimmer and then prodding Nicholas lying on the floor covered in blood. After hours of torture, the masked men leave. Both students, but especially Nicholas, are in bad shape. And it's not over. The monsters return early the next morning for more. They were extremely organized. They had nicknames, they had roles for individuals. They take our wallet, everything from me, my keys, my phone, my wallet. The captors put Ani in the bedroom. They keep Nicholas in the bathroom. They put me into the shower where they started washing me. The entire tub is just red. Turns out Nicholas hadn't been shot once. He'd been shot twice. I was shot in my other leg as well. Did you feel, I mean, they're washing you? Like, were they going to let you go at that point? Honestly, while they were bathing me, they had other individuals who were cleaning the house and bleaching everything down, so it was almost as if they were like trying to cover their tracks. The plan is to not let them go. How did you keep going? I don't know. I thought about my parents and I, how much I mean to them and how much they mean to me, and I didn't want this to be the end. That's what it was for me as well, the fact that my parents would always love me. And for me, that was worth surviving for. So that's how I was able to make the decision that I would do whatever it took to survive. It didn't matter what it was. Now in the bedroom with Ani, survive is what Nicholas is desperately trying to do. That's when these individuals were holding me at gunpoint and they were making me call all these different financial institutions to get my withdrawal limits increased and doing whatever they could to get money out of my accounts. But is all this really just about money? While the football players are negotiating for their lives, their absence is not going unnoticed. Friends and family contact the University of Rochester Public Safety Department, which alerts Rochester PD. As we started to put all this whole story together, we realized something really was uh, not right. First of all, their phones were, both phones were turned off. The second thing was that these, uh, both gentlemen were uh, prolific on uh, social media, always updating what they were doing, where they were, and that it stopped cold Friday night. Also, the fact that they were, had been out of contact with everybody else. Rochester police launch a full investigation, getting search warrants for the boys' phones and Facebook accounts trying to track down uh, the two women that they had met up with. Find the girls and maybe find the boys. While cops are quickly working to identify who these two women are, Nicholas and Ani are coming to grips with the reality that there's no way out. They're trapped. Were you and Ani ever left alone, or was there always someone there watching you? There was always someone, at least one or two individuals, that were kind of watching over us. And so during that time, you guys didn't have a chance to be like, what are we going to do? How are we going to get away or anything like that? Yeah, not really. I mean, obviously he was in better shape than I was. He wasn't shot. Did he seem scared? Yeah, I mean, he was scared. But throughout the whole ordeal, he kind of had this like optimistic view. They're going to release us. But it was hard for me to kind of see that light. It only got worse as time went on. So much worse. I, I want to ask you a question. And if you don't want to answer it, 
that's okay. Because it is so terrifying coming forward and because there are so many prejudices, stereotypes, misunderstandings around this whole topic and, and especially for men, but were you ever sexually abused while you were held captive? Yeah, during the events that took place at one point, these these individuals forced me to kind of do things and it was just terrible and yeah it happened and it's it's the worst feeling ever university of rochester public safety officers and rochester pd now know the clock is ticking they soon catch a break when they track down the girl who messaged ani her name is Samantha Hughes. She was less than helpful. She was trying to give us the runaround. She had to go to work, so she said, can I meet up with you tomorrow and we can finish this. At that point, she really wasn't free to leave. Then they find the second girl, Leah Giliotti. Neither are making it easy for investigators. It was exhausting, so they'd give us a little bit of a lead. We'd be able to follow up on that. Uh, we'd wind it in the dead end. We'd have to come back and get more information. Then a chilling admission. And they said, don't worry, they're not going to be hurt. And the normal person that you meet up with is not going to tell that to the police. So we knew that it wasn't, uh, wasn't normal. The ones who lured the football players into the sadistic trap give up even more. After about six hours, we were able to get a couple of good locations where um, these girls uh, last saw uh, Nico and Ani. Are they getting closer to finding the boys? Undercover officers monitor the two locations. Then, Rochester Deputy Police Chief Scott Peters puts together a plan with the SWAT commanders. This is going to be a, a hostage rescue. And I said, here's the two locations. Plan cold hits on both houses. So you're going to do one, and then we're going to have to do the second one if the, the first house wasn't right. Getting it right the first time could be the difference between life and death. It's now Sunday morning at 22 Harvest Street, more than 30 hours in. While you were being held captive, was there ever a moment that you felt like you were going to give up? Yes. Things have reached a fevered pitch. They came into the room with their masks on and guns and weapons, and they started saying that, that I was lying to them and that my cards weren't working anymore and that they said that they were going to kill us. Nicholas says the kidnappers turn on some loud music to cover the sounds of what's to come. They were just spraying bullets everywhere, and they were putting the gun down our throat and putting the gun to our body and just moving it at the last seconds. And I was holding on his hand, and I just knew that, like, one of these bullets were going to hit me, and, and I was going to die. It's now Sunday night, 9 p.m., almost 40 hours into this kidnapping nightmare. My body was in such bad shape, and... You know, I was just kind of feeling worse and just not optimistic at all that we would be found. What Nicholas Kalias doesn't know is that the cavalry is on the way. Remember Hughes and Giuliani, the girls who lured the football players to that house of horrors? They eventually gave police two addresses. A SWAT team is now ready to hit the first, 22 Harvest Street, not even knowing if it's the right house they roll up. It was eerily silent. Then, out of the darkness, appears a figure. Someone from inside comes out and sees the swarm of a heavily armed SWAT team. Uh, very quickly, he ran back inside and shut the door. The individual who was nicknamed the caretaker came into the room, and, and this was the only time I actually saw any of the individual's faces without a mask on. He was, like, trying to untie us real fast. Outside, the SWAT team sets explosive charges on two doors. They call breach. Then... Both explosive charges go off. The house just lit up. The door gets blown inside. I didn't know what was going on. As the doorway opens up, one person will go left, another person will go right. Upon entry, the SWAT team sees two individuals. There was a, two suspects inside the living room, took them in custody. Cops still aren't sure they're in the hostage house. They make their way through the kitchen, then they see a closed door. As they go through the door, they look in there and 
sure enough, there's the, uh, the two football players are sitting on the floor. There was remnants of tape around their ankles and hands. Uh, they just looked like they had been through hell. I thought the house was being burned down. In reality, they were saving my life. We rolled the dice on the first house we hit was the correct one. This is a once in a career rescue. Do you remember when they came into the room? At first I was kind of scared because it was more individuals just covered in body armor and these huge guns and I was just terrified. Yeah, I'd be pretty scared too. Yeah, so I put my hands up and I'm like, I'm, I'm innocent, like please don't shoot me again. They got us out of the house, got me into an ambulance and off to the hospital. After more than 40 hours of sheer hell, Nicholas and Ani are reunited with their families. I just remember seeing both my parents and more specifically my father. He just came over to me in the stretcher and stuff and he was like, you know, you're safe now and, and you're going to be all right. Nicholas spent the next 25 days in intensive care. As the investigation begins, cops find a stomach-churning video on one of the violent kidnappers' cell phones. Again, a warning, what you're about to see is deeply disturbing. Ani lies bleeding on the floor as the attacker prods and threatens him with an electric hedge trimmer. The camera swings right to reveal Nicholas curled up in pain as the kidnappers throw slurs and prod his injured leg. Look at the what? I'm in this. Oh, this is a this, video? This is a video. Are you recording, homie? This is what I'm gonna do when they take 12 pounds from me. This right here. Stupid. Yo. Look at your boy. He ain't got nothing to do with it. He just got running. Shut up, go. Shut up. You run with the I wrong one. Please. Shut the window. I'll do anything. Cops believe the students were rescued in the nick of time. The plan really was to basically drain all the bank accounts. Nico had a pretty good uh, sum of money. What the bad guys didn't know is you can't access those funds on the weekend. So they were waiting until 8 o'clock in the morning when they could actually access those accounts. And I'm sure once they did that, they probably would have uh, killed them. A month later, all of the perpetrators are in custody. An unbelievable nine in total. Five men and four women. I kind of always thought of women as like harmless individuals that couldn't hurt a fly. I know exactly what you mean. When I was kidnapped, the night I was kidnapped, I was terrified. I remember when I heard the woman's voice, and I remember thinking, it's going to be OK. It's going to be all right. There's yeah. a woman there. Like, right. nothing that bad can happen. Right. Sometimes I wondered if maybe she was worse than he was. Monroe County District Attorney Sandra Dooley says the case was like no other and deserved special attention. I knew that it was going to be high profile and it affected a lot of people in this community personally. So I really wanted to make sure that my best people were on it. This case is a lot of things. It's tragic, sad, but what it certainly is is, is just disgusting. Of the nefarious nine, Five end up taking plea deals, including Samantha Hughes and Leah Giuliani, the women who lured Nicholas and Ani to the house that night. The five received sentences of 13 to 35 years in prison. The other four take their chances at trial. The evidence was overwhelming. As Christine and I you know, got ready for this trial, it was harder to figure out what we weren't going to use than it was to figure out what we were going to use. Uh, there was just that much. But there was one key piece of evidence the jurors would see. The cell phone video was, was clearly, in my opinion, the most essential piece of evidence and, and perhaps, yes, the, also the most damning as well. It essentially showed 30 seconds of torture. And, and when you put that in perspective, that was only 30 seconds out of almost 40 hours. So you can only imagine what they went through during the other 39 hours and change. Ani and Nicholas, who both testify against their kidnappers, watch that grotesque video in court. It was terrible to take me back to that time, and it was just so sickening and heartbreaking. The ringleader, Lydell Strickland, played a starring role in that video. Lydell Strickland was enjoying what was going on. 
He's also seen in other damning videos cops find around town. There were just multiple banks all over the city of Rochester that Lydell Strickland was seen using uh, Nicholas's TD Ameritrade card. It's clearly his face. Uh, in one video, he actually pulls up still wearing a mask that he was wearing during the other cell phone video. After a month-long trial, all four defendants are found guilty on all counts. Three of the defendants are sentenced 7 to 15 years. Lydell Strickland gets 155 years to life. I feel like for each of these defendants and for these victims that justice was served. Nicholas has filed a $10 million lawsuit against the nine kidnappers. But what was the monster's motive for perpetrating this horrific crime? It was not just about money, but revenge. And in a shocking twist, it turns out the kidnappers got the wrong guys. It was definitely a case of mistaken identity. Mistaken identity? That's right. Cops say the target was a completely different University of Rochester football player, Isaiah Smith. Smith, a star athlete and well-known drug dealer, found a spare key to Ani and his twin brother's apartment. Cops say Isaiah Smith then used that apartment to rob Lydell Strickland and his gang of thugs. Strickland and company then wanted revenge, so they told the girls to go get the football players who ripped them off. The drug dealers, when they came back, were looking for the people who lived in that apartment, not realizing that uh, they were, it was just being used by somebody else. So it was, it was definitely a case of mistaken identity. It's appalling. Yeah, I mean, it's, Completely it's totally appalling. unbelievable. And it's Unacceptable. Just, yeah. But Nicholas says there's more to the story and is holding the University of Rochester responsible. He says after Isaiah Smith was arrested, football coaches bailed Smith out of jail and failed to inform the student body of the severity of the crime, all in an attempt to give the star athlete preferential treatment. The university was just completely negligent in what they did. My life was put in jeopardy on numerous occasions, all because of, you know, Isaiah getting bailed out and poor decision-making on many university officials. Nicholas plans to file a civil suit against the University of Rochester. We contacted the University of Rochester, and it responded in part, we disagree with Mr. Kalias's assertions, but we continue to wish him the best as he moves forward after this traumatic experience. Sadly, Nicholas and Ani are no longer friends. He says during their 40-hour ordeal, he received more of the abuse than Ani did and he thinks he knows why. I just feel like with everything that happened, I, I feel like he, he had more to do with it than he will ever admit. I was the one that got majority of all of the beating and abuse, and so, you know, it was just not, not a good experience to have someone who you thought you could trust and just kind of being the complete opposite to you. We reached out to Ani for comment, but he never responded. There was no evidence presented at trial that Ani was in any way involved in planning or carrying out the kidnapping. Ani Okiki Iwu has never been considered anything other than a victim. Nicholas is now trying to move on with his life. He says, although the nightmare he survived will never leave him, He's working hard to not let it define him. People who survive very violent crimes, yes, it's, it's a miracle, it's miraculous that we're here. But I don't think people realize that sometimes surviving is harder. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's not easy. You know, for me, I have always said that I don't want this to hold me back. I don't want this to, you know, label me. I'm not going to let these individuals mess up the rest of my life. And so that's why I'm trying to be optimistic and just positive and move forward in the best way that I can.